page 1. Man the Hunted, Donna Hart and Robert W. Sussman. Primates, Predators, and Human Evolution. Although a man the hunter is a popular description of our ancestry, the central importance of hunting is firmly fixed only in the archaeological record of relatively recent human history. Man the Hunted argues that primates, including the earliest members of the human family, have evolved not as hunters but as the prey of any number of predators, including wild cats and dogs, hyenas, snakes, crocodiles, and even birds of prey. Eyewitness accounts, data collected by the authors, and the published reports of naturalists establish the astonishing extent to which living monkeys, lemurs, apes, and even humans fall victim to a wide variety of predators, some of which even specialize in the consumption of primates. Additionally, the fossil record demonstrates that primates have been prey for millions of years, a fact that necessarily shaped the evolution of our earliest ancestors in body and behavior. Skillfully combining information from a number of lines of evidence, Man the Hunted casts an entirely new light on the natural history of primates and the evolution of fossil and modern humans. Praise for the first edition Hart and Sussman have written a highly readable book, with jazzy subtitles such as A Will the First Hominid Please Stand Up? A Before the Age of Ulcers, and A My, What Big Teeth You Have? Their argument that human beings and their predecessors, during almost the entire period of their evolution, have been preyed on rather than predators is entirely persuasive. A American anthropologist Donna Hart and Robert Sussman's observations of how living primates cope with constant threats bring to life their interpretation of our extinct human relatives and ancestors, along with the role that predation has played on our social and cognitive evolution. Surprise! Surprise, it has always paid to have friends and allies. A new scientist Hart and Sussman's book presents a good synthesis of pertinent ethological observations and a summary of theoretical framing, along with a healthy dose of anecdote. A evolutionary anthropology man the hunted. Dot. Is accessible and interesting. Dot. The authors describe and debate the common view of man as the evolving hunter and present their own view of man's evolution as an adapting prey by integrating fossil records and behavioral data from living predator-prey interactions involving human and non-human primates. A American Journal of Human Biology Contrary to the familiar image of the aggressive, spear-wielding a caveman, our hominid ancestors were more hunted than hunters, more preyed upon than slayers of large predators contend wildlife conservationist Hart and anthropologist Sussman. Dot. T. He authors novel proposals married serious consideration. A Publishers Weekly. In an agile, knowledgeable presentation, the authors contest a popular conception about human evolution, that ancestral hominids were hunters. Dot. To make their case. Which eminent paleoanthropologist he and Tattersalix tolls in a preface as at the first comprehensive synthesis of the information available about predation on humans, Hart and Sussman marshal both fossils and behavioral studies of living primates. The author's prose is wryly irreverent, as if intended to keep a lecture class awake and interested. A book list their thesis is far more complex than merely changing one letter to transform man the hunter into man the hunted. Hunt and Sussman are looking at the whole of human history in a light that's quite different from what most of us have been taught, and dot. Their overall effort is thought-provoking and pretty persuasive. Hey Street Louis Post Dispatch, our readers will eagerly proceed through chapters about the interaction of primates with felines and canines, reptiles and raptors, even sharks. Those are far from dry scientific presentations. The writing is rich with well-crafted stories drawn from the fossil record and from modern observations of predation on our fellow primatessa and humans. At the Dallas Morning News Forward to the first edition Students of human evolution, like hapless skiers attacked by mountain lions, 
have always held equivocal views about the place that Homo sapiens and its predecessors have occupied in the food chain. And as a result they have tended to straddle or shuttle between extremes when attempting to reconstruct the behaviors and lifestyles of our earliest ancestors. Two diametrically opposed traditions in the artistic representation of early hominid lifeways run right back to the very beginnings of paleoanthropology in the mid-19th century. Some of the many artists of the 19th and early 20th centuries who specialized in recreating prehistoric scenes typically depicted small groups of puny and vulnerable early humans huddled nervously around a campfire while big cats circled, awaiting their opportunity to pounce. Others preferred to represent the noble savage, proud and erect and usually armed with a hunting spear or a stone axe, and sometimes with a dog at his heels, striding out in search of quarry. The discovery in 1879 of the astonishing animal images adorning the ceiling of the cave of Altamira, Spain, taken early on to consist of straightforward if powerful and stylized representations of the prey animals of the Ice Age hunters who made them, gave a huge impetus to interpretations of the latter kind. Still, the duality of interpretation lingered well into the last century possibly because both interpretive schools had in common a tendency to emphasize the importance among humans, then as now, of social cooperation, either as an essential ingredient in defense against predators or as an integral component of successful hunting. Another frequent element in these rather anecdotal scenes displayed the use of intelligence and guile by hominids to compensate for their relative lack of strength and of such inbuilt weapons as dagger-like canine teeth. Understandably for those days when the human fossil record was tiny, ancient and extinct kinds of humans were most commonly viewed somewhat as junior league versions of ourselves, with at least echoes of our own vulnerabilities and strengths. Perhaps unexpectedly, when serious scientific attention began to be turned specifically to the matter of how early hominids had lived and thrived within their environments, this attention was focused not on the lifestyles of humans in the late ice ages, but rather on the behaviors of truly ancient human precursors. During the second quarter of the 20th century, Raymond Dart presented the first diminutive hominid bipeds as murderers and flesh hunters, whose violent proclivities had inevitably led to the blood spattered, slaughter gutted archives of human history. Based largely on an interpretation of patterns of bone and tooth breakage at ancient Australopith, archaic, small-brained hominid biped, sites in South Africa now known to date between about 3 and 1.5 million years ago, Dart's vision of humanity's origin in a group of vicious, tool-wielding predators seized the public imagination in mid-century when it was popularized by the sonorist Robert Ardry in his beautifully crafted book African Genesis. Significantly for the recent history of the human sciences, this dramatic view of man the hunter influentially held a stage during the period when many of today's senior figures in paleoanthropology and primatology were being trained. Inevitably, though, the dart, ardry view of mankind's bloody birth ultimately produced a reaction that swung interpretation toward the opposite end of the spectrum of possibilities. Studies by Bob Brain during the 1960s and 1970s of South African Australopith assemblages clarified how the fossils came to be jumbled and fragmented as elements washed into underground cavities, or as body parts accumulated by predators or scavengers, rather than as a result of murderous breakage by hominid killers in their lairs. Dramatically, Brain demonstrated that twin punctures in a skull fragment of a juvenile Australopith were perfectly matched by those of a fossil leopard, whose relative had doubtless dragged the hapless hominid's body into a tree, as leopards still do with the corpses of umpas and other unfortunate prey. Still, some of the South African Australopith sites, notably that of Cirquefontein, cover a period of well over a million years. And in his detailed examination of this site in his 1981 book The Hunters or the Hunted, Brain suggested that while at about 2.5 million years ago the cats apparently controlled the Strickfontein cave, dragging their Australopithecine victims into its darkest recesses, 
By a million years later hominids had not only evicted the predators but had taken up residence in the very chamber where their ancestors had been eaten. This set the stage for a more nuanced view than darts of early hominid lifestyles, and one which emphasized the vulnerability of the small-bodied early hominids who first quit the shelter of the forest and ventured out into the expanding woodlands and grasslands. Still, Brain's book envisaged an almost inexorable progression by hominids toward predatory behaviors. In the 1990s, with increasing knowledge of the ways in which our closest living relatives the great apes behave, the pendulum began to swing more emphatically. Beginning with the assumption that early hominids were more in the nature of evolved apes than of unperfected humans, though the conclusions need hardly have differed either way, some primatologists began to point to the fact that apes have been documented to behave in some pretty nasty ways, up to and including what has been characterized as genocide as when the males of one chimpanzee community in Tanzania systematically wiped out those of a neighboring one. Thus became popularized the notion of the demonic male, whose extreme and enduring hunting proclivities have been turned inward, toward members of his own species, and to whom by extension we owe many of the less endearing traits we human beings display today. These include the male domination of women and mayhem of all kinds. The latest wrinkle on this re-energization of the notion of man the hunter has been the claim that it was the regular cooking, initially of tubers, but by extension of meat, that spurred the origin of our genus Homo at around two million years ago, and that this in turn was responsible for our modern, western, though not universal, bare-bonded social system and a slew of other human behavioral peculiarities. Well, all of this makes a good story even though there is precious little evidence of the regular domestication of fire before about 400,000 years ago, or maybe, according to the latest reports, a little more. But are all good stories necessarily true? And more specifically, is this one true? If you are inclined to believe the chorus of reports in the press, which is famously receptive to reductionist explanations of almost everything, you might readily conclude that behaviorally speaking we are indeed the prisoners of our genes, that the way we human beings behave today is the result of millions of years of fine-tuning by natural selection, deep in our evolutionary past. But if we look at the archaeological record, the archive of the behaviors of our predecessors, it is readily evident that significant behavioral innovations over the course of human evolution have been both sporadic and rare. The pattern we observe, whether physically or behaviorally, is certainly not what one would expect from a generation-by-generation -generation process of improvement via natural selection. Further, it seems that in, rather recently, acquiring its unique symbolic reasoning processes, mankind made a qualitative leap, a leap that was not simply an extrapolation of trends that are discernible earlier in human evolution. For example, a small window of time in our recent history points toward an adoption of true big game hunting, yet millions of years of our early history indicates that we were mainly a prey species. Clearly the unprecedented qualities of our species are the result of an emergent event, and there is indeed something truly different about the way we Homo sapiens behave that seems to distinguish us from even our closest ancestors. And as a result. It is evident that we cannot attribute the ways in which we behave directly to our genes or even, more indirectly, to our history, as a bee or an angel fish might much more plausibly do. So what can we reasonably say about our ancestral heritage, and more specifically about the roles of our ancestors as the hunting or the hunted? And what, if anything? Is the relevance of all this for the mysterious ways in which members of our peculiar species act today? For an accessible and innovative appraisal of these issues I cannot think of a better place to turn than to this elegantly accessible book by Donna Hart and Bob Sussman. These gifted primatologists recognize that to inquire whether the place of humans in nature is properly as hunters or as hunted is to create a peculiarly human paradox. For of course, at one time or another, we are and were both. This is particularly significant because, 
In a very real sense, in our present incarnation we are interlopers into the web of nature, our forebears having very recently taken an entirely new ecological turn. And although we are neither condemned to be a predator as a leopard is, nor to be constantly preyed upon as a wildebeest must be, elements of both conditions nonetheless linger within most human beings. Insulated as most of us are today from the practical dangers of predation, we are nonetheless, often, meat-eaters who are still haunted by atavistic fears, and Hart and Sussman eloquently explain why. Crend with captivating anecdotes but always with its feet firmly on the scientific floor, this intensely readable volume explains how the intricate web of nature is constructed, what we can reasonably say about how our predecessors fitted into it, and how our past has contributed to our sometimes rather uncomfortable place in the world today. And, most importantly, it tells us how predation upon our species has significantly molded its history. Man the Hundred presents the first comprehensive synthesis of the information available about predation on humans in both ancient and recent times, and it combines the insights thus gained with a penetrating survey of an extraordinary range of data on human fossils, primate and human behavior, ancient habitats, the archaeological record, and a host of other topics relevant to the understanding of human origins. The result is a revolutionary but convincingly documented perception of the origins of our earliest ancestors not as fearsome killers, but as another primate prey species. If you are looking for a truly unusual and innovative perspective upon the human story, read on. A. Ian Tattersill New York City June 2004 Preface to the Expanded Paperback Edition we are very grateful for this opportunity to rethink and update some of the materials in the book since its first printing in 2005. We have not changed chapters 1 through 10 from the first edition except to correct a few minor typos. However, in the new chapter 11, we've reiterated our hypothesis of man the hunted and summarized some of the main reasons why we believe our earliest human ancestors were neither systematic hunters nor inherently violent. Rather, we were omnivores and our natures are mainly formulated by what we learn who we are cultural animals. There have been many new discoveries and a number of old discoveries that have now become pertinent to a man the hunted hypothesis. The number of ancestral fossils showing evidence of predation continues to accumulate. There are new data on predators. We now have more essentials concerning the coexistence of extinct bears with early humans in Africa and exciting new information on snakes and birds of prey. In the added chapter, we discuss these findings. Publication of this expanded paperback, also has enabled us to attend to some aspects of the man the hunted hypothesis that we did not address earlier to uncover, or at least bring to light, some lingering questions, what is the connection between the evolution and enlargement of the brain and meat-eating? How prevalent has cannibalism been in ancient and recent human history? What do markings made by prehistoric tools and carnivore tooth marks found on two million year old mammal bones tell us about early human hunting or scavenging? If these early humans were not hunters, were they scavengers? Did the need for humans to live in groups to protect themselves from predation lead to the selection of behavioral, hormonal, and neurological traits that rewarded and reinforced sociality and cooperation? How and why do new theories in science get accepted or, on the other hand, ignored? In the added chapter, we have attempted to shed some light on all of these questions, while updating other aspects of the earlier edition. We would like to thank Questview Press, the publisher, for this new, enlarged paperback edition. We are especially grateful to Carl Yambert, executive editor at Westview for his constant encouragement, editorial advice, and support in making both the earlier and this edition possible. We also thank Scott McGraw, Tom Headland, Harry Green, Adrian Zeilman, Jerry Lowenstein, 
and Ann Gibbons for providing new information and material that assisted us in the preparation of this edition. Thanks to Kimberly Wilbanks for her accurate and timely research assistance. Many thanks, in addition, to the Biological Anthropology section of the American Anthropological Association for honoring us with the W. W. Howells Book Prize in 2006. Finally, we thank the readers and hope that we have provided a good read, a new way to think about an old paradigm, and a refreshing way to ponder our shared evolutionary past. Page 16